A new report by the Heritage Foundation taking a look at whether the U.S. military can handle two conflicts at the same time, essentially a report card on America's military strength. One of the authors is retired Lieutenant Colonel Dakota Wood. He is a senior research fellow at Heritage, and we talked with him earlier today about this study. So it's a, it's a report card on the on the year preceding. Kind of, you have a student in school, you get to the end of the year, and how'd you do? So we look at the status of American military power, and we try to relate it to events in the world, the ability of friends to help out, and the ability of our competitors to cause problems. And the overall score really didn't change much from last year, largely because funding hasn't uh, changed that much that would enable the military to be much different than it was in the past. And I'll explain that. On a scale of one to five, we get a bit of a three. We call that marginal because we feel that the U.S. military in its current size and uh, the nature of its equipment uh, is just able to secure U.S. interests on a global scale and would really only be able to handle a major conflict in one region. It would take just about all of the military to do that But that means that you have vulnerabilities in other parts of the world. So we think that as a global power, it's not a good position for the U.S. to be in, and more attention needs to be paid to the military to expand it in size and really update a lot of its capabilities that were introduced 30 or 40 years ago. And in the report, you focus on three specific categories, capacity, capability, and readiness, Mm -hmm. with the conclusion that the U.S. is prepared to fight two major wars. Define what you mean by major. Uh, So in that, from a historical standpoint, it's something like Korea or what we experienced in Desert Storm uh, back in 1991. So some kind of an event with a a medium-sized major power. If you're talking about a global conflict or something on the order of World War II in either Europe or Pacific, it's going to take everything you've got and more. I mean, mobilization of reserves, you know, drafting of people. And so that, that really is at the extreme end. But we're talking about a major regional-type conflict. We think that the United States needs to have the ability to handle two of those because if you only have enough capacity for one, which is about where we're at, you either don't get involved where you where you need to, or if you do, you have no ability to deter opportunistic exploitation by some other competitor in different regions. So, for example, if China really did invade Taiwan and we felt compelled to go in and and assist Taiwan, you'd be stripping forces from Europe and other places to be able to do that. That then opens up opportunity for Russia to make a move on the Baltics, you know, just as a as an example. We're talking with retired Lieutenant Colonel Dakota Wood. He is a senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation. And you look at some of the growing threats, specifically terrorism, China, Iran, Russia, North Korea, and the Middle East. So in those areas, what are the threats that we are facing? Well, we include terrorism organizations, terrorist groups, whether it's Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, what have you, not because they pose some existential threat, you know, in the true sense of the word to the United States, but because they destabilize important regions. And where do you have that kind of destabilization? Again, it compromises existing governments, rule of law, economic viability, and it opens up a window. Uh, for larger actors like Iran or Russia or China to really get involved and cause worse problems. So we need to be attentive to that. The big players are China and Russia. Massive economies, you'll be able to field uh, homegrown new capabilities, <clears throat> uh, cyber, hypersonic munitions, directed energy, the uh, uh, application of artificial intelligence, all these sorts of things. They have deep nuclear benches. Ocean-going, deep ocean-going submarines, aircraft carriers, especially with China building its third. So those are really the key major competitors, almost on the order of what we saw in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. North Korea is very localized. Nuclear weapons are a big deal, but its aspirations aren't regional or global. Its aspirations are survival, and it sees nuclear weapons as the guarantee of that. Iran is much more uh, nuanced. It uses proxies, surrogates, uh, funding of terrorist organizations to extend its influence across the Arabian Peninsula, so through Iraq, down in through Saudi Arabia, and into um, Lebanon. And uh, so it's it's a much more cagey kind of actor, but it has nuclear aspirations as well. So we feel that each one of those 
either threatens the United States directly, like the big players, <clears throat> has the potential to cause a major regional war, and we would want to be able to resolve that on, on favorable terms because of the economic interconnectedness of the United States and the rest of the world, and then uh, to enable us and other countries to use the commons, you know, air space and sea space, in order to engage in trade and the free flow of people. So those are the big competitors we see that pose those levels of challenges, unlike, let's say, a criminal cartel in Mexico. You know, it's, it's, it's bad, but it doesn't rise to the level that we have targeted these other uh, actors. The report is titled The 2020 Index of the U.S. Military Strength. It's available online at heritage.org. Colonel Wood, thank you for being with us. Great pleasure. Thank you.